Welcome to our July podcast, AI and Cardiology. This is your host, Pratik Doshi. I currently serve as the editor of the Jack Edge monthly newsletter, where we do a month where we do a monthly deep dive review of hot topics in cardiology in an innovative and engaging format. I'm very fortunate to be joined by the illustrious Dr. Ami Butt, who is the Chief Innovation Officer for ACC and holds a deep expertise in digital health and innovation across the field of cardiology. Dr. Butt previously served as the Director of Outpatient Cardiology and Telecardiology at Massachusetts General Hospital. She was the Richard Libson Endowed Scholar in Adult Congenital Heart Disease at MGH and now runs the MGH Elevate Leadership Program. Dr. Butt, we're so lucky to have you here with us. Thank you so much for having me. So before we get started, would love for you to share a few words about yourself, maybe give us a one-liner about who you are, as well as maybe a pick of the week, a movie, book, or a show recommendation that's not medicine-related for our listeners. Great. Well, um, thank you, first of all, for having me. I'm so excited to be here and, and really to talk about this topic. So the one-liner on who I am, oh, that's um, that's a good one. So for the one-liner, um, cardiologist, boots on the ground. Um, in the clinical arena, kind of every day during my career, um, and had the opportunity uh, as telemedicine was somewhat forced to take off during COVID um, to see the opportunity to really reach our patients better uh, in a way that works better for them, in a way that works better for the system, um, using digital health and thinking about how we can combine technology with a really high level of scientific rigor that we've already achieved. Um, and so excited to now uh, start what almost feels like a second career uh, as a chief innovation officer. Um, a book that I would recommend people read uh, that actually my family will laugh because I can't stop talking about it is Project Hail Mary. It's written by Andy Weir, who m- many people may know um, by having written The Martian. Uh, but it's a, a really great story and it makes us just think far and wide about what possibilities are and what we think we know. Um, and what really might exist out there. So I think for those who are uh, enthusiasts of what could be Project Hail Mary by Andy Weir, uh, I couldn't stop talking about it. I still can. Yeah, and I think that's actually, I haven't read it, but I'm really excited to pick it up. But it's a great segue for this topic in general, you know, AI and cardiology, this world that seems almost foreign, but is coming at us at a breakneck speed and we're forced to adapt to it. So to kind of start us off, what is the current state of AI and cardiology? And where do you see the integration of AI in clinical practice most immediately? Yeah, um, I'm going to go back a step and talk about how people really said telemedicine and remote monitoring was new to cardiology. And if you think about it, it isn't. We've had pacemakers for a long time. We've been remotely monitoring people for a very long time. And so it was very natural for that industry to become part of what cardiology does. I will tell you, that the state of AI and cardiology, um, even though we feel like it's advancing quickly, is able to advance because we have a great infrastructure, because AI is based on algorithms Mm -hmm. and is really based on the ability to take a set of data and then create understanding out of it, and then give it to a clinician and say, here's what I see, can you use this information? Mm -hmm. And we've been doing that in cardiology in the form of excellent scientific evidence, but also thoughtful algorithms for a very long time. So AI and cardiology is really just the next natural step of that evolution. Technology is caught up enough to be able to move at a speed that actually that technology can now help us rather than be something that's interesting or like to have. And instead we say, wow, for the amount of data out there, for any one patient I sit in the office and see, the human brain just isn't able to capture all that data. But with the assistance of AI, right, of of artificial intelligence, I am now able to see things I couldn't see and then decide myself as a clinician, because the acumen is mine, whether or not I want to use that. So what is the current state? I think the current state is we're in a natural evolution. Uh, We are where we should be. And the key part now is what we refer to as collaborative intelligence. Mm -hmm. The computer can't go any further without us as clinicians interacting with these technologies and shaping it to be the next version of cardiology. Yeah, that's actually such a great point, this collaborative intelligence idea, because, you know, the question that is always thrown around, at least in the, in pop culture is, is AI going to replace our jobs? But I love this idea that AI is going to enhance our ability to do our jobs better. Uh, and, you know, big data obviously has been a big focus of discussion. And, and I think maybe what you're alluding to is that 
this might be a way we can address this massive amount of data and use it in a in a patient directed manner. Yeah, and I I think that's exactly it. You know, the way I like to think about it is I I almost split it into a few different concepts. So the first is just if you think about what we call administrative burden, right? Or just kind of quality of work. There's a lot of work that we're doing as clinicians that probably doesn't need to be done by us, that can be automated. Mm -hmm. And so that doesn't actually, you know, qualify per se as clinical decision-making AI. This is just getting the logistics to work better for us. So one example more recently is generative AI. Thinking about sitting in an office, talking with your patient, having um, that conversation recorded and then turned into a note for you based on the text of hundreds of thousands of notes that we would train such a application on. That's something we could all use. Our back won't be to our patients anymore while we're typing, or we won't be writing notes for four hours after our kids go to sleep. So, so that's, you know, when sometimes people say, what are you going to see most immediately? I think we're going to see that because we need it. Because mm -hmm. if we want to keep people in the practice, we want to make the quality of work better. Some of those basic things have nothing to do with really wanting to be a clinician, but more so just the logistics of how the day goes and, and how to get work done. So I think that's where we're going to see AI first. The second part is starting to think now about clinical care. And I'll say that population health is really important. We recognize that we have equity issues, but how are we going to ensure that we're finding the people who need care and we're moving forward? And so we have a lot of work to do with our databases and our systems to ensure that they are, first of all, free of structural racism, mm -hmm. second of all, inclusive of all of what we need. But the entire field is moving there. And I think as medicine and public health come closer aligned together, which has been happening you know, for a decade and a half or so, but especially ever since COVID, we'll notice that using AI to see trends in population health and help us direct resources and even digital medicine, right? Remote monitoring to the right areas is really important. Let me give an example. I'm speaking with the American Telemedicine Association. Mm -hmm. We can do heat maps of which areas have the highest risk of hypertension in the US. They do heat maps of where connectivity is best. If you find an area that overlaps with high rates of hypertension and good connectivity, a remote monitoring program would be excellent. But if you find an area that has high rates of hypertension and not great connectivity, that's where you need boots on the ground. That's where you need to partner with local organizations. And so in that way, we can really use resources the same way. So I think population health is second. And then the third, which is where everybody goes, is, is AI going to be a doctor instead? Well, AI can't be a doctor, mm -hmm. but it can learn and offer to you the medical information that might be necessary for a certain patient with a certain diagnosis. And it can probably do that faster and at greater breadth than you can, but it doesn't have the experience you have with humans, with interacting, with seeing different versions of these diseases. And so again, this is where collaborative intelligence comes in. We really want to be able to allow the clinicians to be the best they can be, but that actually includes giving them the information that they need. Yeah. I think you know, emphasizing the fact that the human aspect of medicine is a critical component. And there truly is no replacement for, you, you know, the residency training or the fellowship training or being in attending and seeing thousands of patients present with the same disease in 5,000 different ways, you know? So, so I, I, I love, again, we just love this idea of collaborative intelligence and I'm really excited for how that drives the future of medicine. I think one of the parts we might be missing in training, which we are all working hard to figure out how to how to place in, is once we start having more point of care information available, how do we incorporate that? How do we use it? How do we assess it? How do we think about it? Right. So we have journal club and we talk about, okay, what do they put in the intro? Are their methods section correct? How much time do we spend at journal club thinking about the methods section? We are going to have to create similar mechanisms of teaching about using technology at the point of care, whether it's for informatics, whether it's for intervention, and how do we teach that? So I think you know the journal club of AI of the future is coming, not where we review a paper, but where we review a process and talk mm -hmm. about what the benefits and the risks might be. And we teach each other about that. Um, and I think that's gonna be a really important part of the residency fellowship training you were just talking about. Yeah, and I think you know even beyond that, for Jack overall as a journal and other, other journals that, that cover the space of technology and medicine, the research landscape is dynamically changing. 
And I'd love for you to talk a little bit about how you think AI tools, such as things like ChatGPT and large language models, influences the way we interpret and will understand research moving forward. Yeah. Oh, we have to be careful here. So <laughs> um, the information contained in Jack journals is so rich and it is so nuanced. Um, large language models take text. And the more times you see similar text associated with each other, oftentimes the more likely you are to pull that text, right? Mm -hmm. So we're gonna need a few things. One is we're gonna need to recognize that we're just pulling blocks of text. We just have to accept that, right? Mm -hmm. this, we're not thinking about it. The computer doesn't think, it pulls. The second is it pulls it without context. So if you say something like um, the EKG revealed that this was blank, a heart attack, right? You know, this was a heart attack or this was not a heart attack. You can put either one in, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so the question becomes, do you know why this might or might not be a heart attack? And can we teach a large language model that if you see somebody elderly with diabetes with something else, whereas if you see a young person playing athletics, but then in young person playing athletics, you're going to miss all the patients I've cared for my whole life. So you can't make assumptions. And so large language models cannot make assumptions do not yet understand context the way physicians um, and, and nurses and other clinicians do. And so I think it's important to recognize that. And then I think the last thing is we have to know where data came from and we have to be able to verify that. And so large language models, if you talk about chat GPT, you know, um, it itself, if you use it today, isn't going to tell you the reference for where it got the information. And we have to, we have to mandate that you're telling me from where you're pulling something if you're giving me information. Mm -hmm. And so I think those are some basic things that people need to understand before we can start using chat GPT. So if you asked me to do it perfectly, I'd say if we took all the Jack journals and we trained a model just to pull from Jack journals and nothing else, just for an example. Mm -hmm. And then we had people actually evaluate when you do it, you know, what comes up? What are we missing? How do you ask a question better? It's kind of like Alexa at home. Oh, I'm even afraid to say her name. She's going to speak up now. But if you, you know, ask her, sometimes she doesn't give me what I want. I have to reformulate how I'm talking to her. We have to reformulate how we use large language models to investigate what is very good data in the Jack journals to be able to use it appropriately. Yeah, that's really interesting. You know, it really reminds me of growing up, obviously, Google search was, is, and will always, you know, or at least for right now, is a big component of how you got through schooling and everything and learning how to search well is a big component of, you know, part of growing up and in, in this digit, digitized age. So it seems like that it's going to be that same model just applied to an entirely new system, learning how to appropriately ask the questions that will give you the answer that's least, you know, biased and least you know, incorrect and everything like that. that that's exactly right. I, I'm glad that the listeners can't see my face because my smile <laughs> couldn't be any bigger right now um, because I'm dating myself, right? What did I, I had to learn a Dewey Decimal System and I used the Countway Library at Harvard Medical School, right? I, I did not have Google when I was learning. And so, you know, each generation has something that to the previous one seems like a completely no way to learn. But then we figure it, or figure it out and we learn and we make it better. Um, and so I think that's exactly the transition that's happening again. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it'll be it'll be exciting to kind of be a part of this of this adventure and kind of figure out how do we use these things to our advantage rather than being swayed by misinformation and everything, which has become such a problem. Absolutely. And, and even more than it's exciting, it's necessary. Mm -hmm. It's a mandate. So absolutely. we as clinicians, um, our fellows, our residents, we have to be using this and figuring out how to use it better and sharing that with each other because people will use it no matter what. And so we should really be shaping the future of how this is used in medicine. Yeah. Well, so I guess that brings up a good point. As trainees, as fellows, as attendings, you know, this is something that we need to learn how to integrate in our practice. But we also need to be concerned about some of the data issues. Uh, when, when models like this have access to large swaths of data uh, as kind of the curators of that data, and you know the people who face uh, or interface with patients. How do we how do we balance that? How do we assess whether an AI tool or device can protect a patient's data and should be applied to clinical practice? Yeah. So so there's actual guidelines that they need to follow, right? And they should have those documents and they should be able to share with you how they built it um, and what they did. But the way I like to think about it is when um, 
COVID first happened, people wanted to FaceTime, right? And we knew how kind of unsafe that was going to be versus use the medical version of Zoom and what they had gone through to do that, or you know, pick any other number of platforms. And the, the same is true right now. Um, we are working in a variety of places and we're actually working to do this together, uh, both at the governmental level here in the US, the European Union also has statements about this between the ACC, the AMA, um, kind of many organizations working together really to be able to have governance of AI, safety of AI, privacy, and ensure that everybody is following the same rules. I do think it's important to ensure that you have people at your practice or institution who understand this landscape before you go plugging things in and using them. Um, and for those who, and I'm sure nobody does this, but just in case, please don't put any private health information into any of these things, right? That That is not safe. So for now, the kind of access we have, we have to be careful with. So where can the easily accessible, because we're talking about the chat GPT type things, where can that help us in more of the general questions? I want to be able to teach about this to my fellows. Yes. Can I pull up some general information faster, right? Can I pull up some images um, and be able to teach that or be able to refresh my memory or understand that a little bit better? And it's like kind of like Google advanced, if you will, right? To be able to get exactly what you want. For the actual machine learning, for deep learning, for looking at neural networks, those kind of mechanisms are going to be taught on very large um, quantity data, and then in order to be used in your system are going to need to meet the kind of guidelines that we are asking for to keep people safe. So you do what you can with the easily accessible things, recognize it, just make sure that the companies are doing what they are, but we're also working on that at a national and global level. Yeah, so I think this is gonna be a field that's pretty exciting to see as we get better guidelines and even as we get better tools and how the two kind of merge together. Well, you know, the lawyers are having a great time with this. One of my really good friends um, who started working in, in digital health along with me in 2013, um, and he's in the legal side, we often talk about um, the future of the use of AI. And so my comparison is usually an airline pilot, right? Um, do you want to fly in a plane that's just flown by autopilot? Do you want to fly in a plane that's flown just by a human? Or would you prefer the two together? We would all prefer to do the two together. Mm -hmm. From a legal aspect, he says, Gosh, can you think of how people would be held responsible if they put people on a 777 and either had no pilot or no autopilot? Because we just expect that. When you look at the future of medicine, if we do it right, the use of these types of algorithms and AI to help support a clinician in providing care may very well be just a future expectation that we have. Um, I know we're gonna go over time, but I wanna tell you about a friend of mine who uh, is a physician. And her child needed congenital heart surgery. And she said, I asked the surgeon, can you tell me mm -hmm. for a child like mine with, you know, demographics and history and risk factors and disease, how have people done? Mm -hmm. And it was very interesting because we have lots of great surgical registries, but to very quickly pull out that information at the fingertips during that meeting was something that both that physician wanted and the physician mother wanted, and they couldn't do just because we're still just a little bit far away from being able to do that. But that's the future. And that's the future everybody wants. We want that for our own health. Mm -hmm. We want to know what does this really mean for me? And it turns out that most of the data is out there. We just have to figure out how to get it safely, how to make sure that it is accurate enough to support a smart clinician in using it. Yeah. And I think what's for me personally, as you know, trainee who's applying to cardiology soon and kind of entering this field, it's really exciting because I feel like this is an opportunity where as clinicians, we get a chance to shape the future. Uh, you know, looking at it more retrospectively, digital health and all these tools have come out into popular use without clinicians and, and people who understand the healthcare system guiding that transition. But I really feel with AI, this is an opportunity for us to really have input and and guide things in a way that advance patient care rather than, you know, hinder it. Yes, that's so true. I think there are two places where the future, specifically AI and ML, right? Talking about kind of machine learning um, are going to be very helpful. We've seen what it does in radiology that applies to any cardiac imaging, true. Mm -hmm. However, I think uh, one is when we think about being in the hospital and the assisted reads, right? We have a pre-read. Mm -hmm. More than that, I'd rather know that if there are X number of reads in a hospital for whatever type of scan, 
things that might be urgent are brought to our attention sooner. Because right now we just go in order, right? Mm -hmm. But but we don't know that that's the best way to do it because likely there's something sitting that's about to be read that is more dangerous that I haven't seen yet. And so I think those kind of things are close and could be a great use. And, and if it's not exactly right, we'll correct it. We'll work with it. There's always a clinician doing the read. It's simply suggesting, hey, this one seems more dangerous. Want to pop that to the top of your list, right? And what a difference that would make. Just picture everything that happens from there as that snowball runs down the hill. Yeah. And it all starts earlier, right? And that's a huge difference for our patients and, and for how we feel about our care. Um, the second place, as I think about the use of ML, is those areas where there's a lack of clarity. Mm -hmm. not those areas where it's clear that this person needs surgery for aortic stenosis, or it's clear that this person does not, they should go on, but that middle range, right? Just take moderate as, a, as an example. Could we train our ML well enough to be able to help us with those patients where we don't know how they're going to progress? And therefore we rely on symptoms, which may be too late. We mm -hmm. rely on expensive imaging, which may be unnecessary and too frequent. We each do it maybe even a little bit differently despite guidelines. It's those areas where we have a lack of clarity, where I think big data, and really this is where the intelligence of artificial intelligence comes in, may notice things that we don't and can subcategorize to say in this one thing that you see as a group, I see A, B, and C, C is at the most risk. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to be the exciting part of the future. Yeah, I'm, I the more I speak to you, the more excited I get and the more I hope to be involved in part of this transition. So no, I really appreciate this. The last question I do have for you is for clinicians that want to learn more. Uh, do you have any resources either from ACC or beyond that you can refer them to? Yeah, um, The uh, innovation member section run by David Cho, Jennifer Silva, and a really great group of individuals um, is building some curriculum. Um, that we'll be able to hopefully provide directly um, over the next coming months and years. Um, in the meantime, I think it's probably um, a great opportunity, depending on how interested you are, um, first of all, to really look to um, the Jack journals, um, mm -hmm. look to Jack advances. There are also new digital health journals that are coming up from some of our um, sister organizations. And so that's a nice place to even just read the summary and abstract and get a sense of where you're going. Um, there are organizations like AI Med. Uh, that have entire conferences um, that you can go to and learn a lot more. Um, and then a few other places where we see some good information about digital health from a different aspect um, are the HLTH, the health conference that happens in the fall, and the Consumer Electronics Society conference that happens in the winter, because that's where a lot of the consumer tech actually ends up going and being. That's what people are seeing outside of the medical industry. And those are the people who are kind of making it onto the shelf. And one of our goals at ACC Innovation and ACC in general is we don't want really good things to sit on the shelf. Mm -hmm. We want them to be good enough to be implemented, to have those companies and those people understand what workflow is for us. What is our life like and how can you really fit in without making it harder? Mm -hmm. And then a large part of what we're doing is really trying to teach then our own membership how do we now use this? So as you'll see more partnerships coming out of ACC with these tech companies, hopefully you'll also see more education. Um, the two you can look up so far are the ACC Telehealth Workbook and the ACC Point of Care Ultrasound Workbook, both of which came out. We actually just had a Twitter space on Focus. Um, there's a Care at Home and a Remote Patient Monitoring coming out next. And those are really how-to guides, the basics of like, if I want to get started. Um, Lastly, people should really feel free to contact me. I'm uh, a but a b h a t t at acc.org. Um, there are so many interesting things going on, so many interesting people to meet. Um, but maybe if I know a little bit more about the individual who's looking to learn more, um, I can help pair them up with the right people. That's very, very kind of you. Thank you for sharing your contact info. And we'll make sure that's in the show notes as well. Dr. Great. But thank you so much for your time. It was such a pleasure to speak with you. And I look forward to seeing all the wonderful work you've been doing with ACC. Oh, and thank for, you for having me. This is really great. And, and Jack Edge, the podcast is just fantastic. I enjoy it wholeheartedly. So it's really nice to be here. We appreciate the shout out. Um, for more information and content about AI and cardiology, as well as other hot topics in cardiology, please subscribe to our newsletter. And for our listeners, this is your host, Pratik Doshi. And we hope to catch you next time on the Jack Edge podcast. Thank you.